from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Coming up today out of the Livestock Marketing Information Center, Caitlin McCulloch with the Cattle Market segment. Among other things, she'll talk about how logistical problems in the beef sector are contributing to the large gap between fed cattle prices and boxed beef prices. Also today, a look at two cattle health topics, a comparison of generic antimicrobial treatments for cattle and the mainstay treatment products, and the difference between Yoni's disease and BVD in cow herds. That from the staff of the Beef Cattle Institute here at K-State. Later, K-State's Gretchen Sassenrath previews the upcoming Spring Crops Field Day at K-State's Southeast Research and Extension Center. Plus more right here on Agriculture Today. For information on threatening weather, you should depend on the National Weather Service and their broadcast on NOAA Weather Radio. NOAA Weather Radio is an all-hazards radio network that provides up-to-the-minute weather information, including life-saving warnings anytime, day or night. NOAA Weather Radio also broadcasts information on man-made disasters such as chemical spills, amber alerts, or other national emergencies. For the National Weather Service, I'm Bill Curtis. Welcome once again to another Agriculture Today, our Monday edition here on the K-State Radio Network. Glad to have you aboard as always. Well, Never lack for excitement in any of the commodity markets right now, and you can include in that the cattle trades. It's our weekly cattle market segment for you now. Welcoming in from the Livestock Marketing Information Center out in Denver, the director of that center, Caitlin McCulloch, for some input here. Looking back at last week's trade, Caitlin, the cash-fed cattle market, well, it's still in effect trading sideways, but this is in the face of quite strong boxed beef prices out there, isn't it? Yeah, so the fed cattle market ended the week about 118, which is slightly down from the tops we saw earlier in the year. And yet boxed beef prices continue to just show strong gains week over week. We're going to see another week over week change here last week, uh, which is the ninth consecutive week, I believe, where we've had continued increases in the cutout. The rib primal's over five hundred dollars per hundred weight for choice box beef. Um, another powerful number there, and I think both of those things point to restaurant sectors pipeline refilling, opening up demand. You're also hitting that charge and, and grilling. At least in my area of the country, we're already grilling outside, and a lot of times beef is what's on the menu. And so all those demand side functions are lining up really well. Um, But on the other side of that, you still have cattle slaughter that seems like it's still dealing with some post-pandemic issues, possibly on the labor front, as well as maybe logistically line speeds might still be a little bit slower. And so we do have, it's not anywhere close to what it was last year in terms of a bottleneck, but I do think that is impacting the beef supply chain still today. And if we remember to last year, what we saw was extremely high cutout values and very low cattle prices. So from a margin perspective, those two are closer together than what they were a year ago. So in April of last year, we were looking at $700 spread between live to cutout per thousand pounds of steer. And in April of this year, we're looking at about 681. So if you remember, the big, big spreads happened a little bit later in the year when we saw cutout spreads closer to $1,500 in May of last year. We're not anticipating the spread to get quite that large again, but these spreads are large by historical standards. And I think until you work through some of those logistics, there is going to be a little bit of disconnect there between what box beef might be doing and where the live cattle price might be. So when uh, there's, to put it this way, Caitlin, chat about packer margins, it is those logistics that need to be kept front and center, it sounds. I think that's one of the things that we're seeing that's that's harder to measure. And it's one of those things that we anecdotally hear that absentee is still a problem, that Saturday kill needs to run very high nationally in order to even get the numbers we are seeing. We're hearing a little bit of union contracts coming into play and how many shifts they work or the hours. Most of what we hear is relatively anecdotal, um, but it does seem like there's quite a bit of evidence that points to some of those logistical issues. On the feeder cattle market side, this trade continues to take punches. 
from feeding prices, feeding costs. One wonders when that's going to cool down some. I think that's the million dollar question is how high will corn actually go? If you think about other times in the U.S. history where we've had some very high corn prices, uh, the 11, 12, 12, 13, 13, 14 uh, years where we had significant yield issues and production declines, corn kind of topped out in that $8 range. Now, this is, uh, at least on the corn side, not a balance sheet issue. It's a demand, it's strong demand, and it's how, how high could we really go? In Omaha, we're at 745, I believe, uh, last week for the Thursday price. That is pretty similar to what we saw in both those big drought years for a price. I pulled uh, the last week of April and they were in the sixes, very similar to what we're seeing on the cash corn side. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean this pattern will follow those because, again, that was a supply issue. This is much more structured on the demand side, at least for corn. The feeder cattle market is is just watching these feed costs and wondering to themselves how much higher can it go because I think feedlot margins are looking at this as well. It doesn't seem like we're going to see a whole lot of relief unless we have a, an enormous crop this year. If you look at the drought monitor, there is some reasons to be concerned about this planting season. It's a little early yet. We could definitely still get rains in a timely manner. Uh, but the corn belt's dry. About 45% of that Midwest area is in some form of drought. If you look at some of those more fringe states, North Dakota is very, very dry. And I think that those fringe states are where you might see acres shift quite a bit between corn and soybeans or or something else or may, or may not end up having a harvestable crop um, after all. All those things are a wait and see type of situation given it's only May. But the feeder cattle market is reacting to those on a daily basis on the futures board. Friday's price action on the feeder cattle side, very wide swings, a lot of volatility right now in those markets. Um, And a lot of that has to do with feed costs and what's going to happen there. Hay prices remain really tight in the West. We're looking at prices nationally above a year ago for other hay and alfalfa. I don't see those coming down before we get into maybe even second cutting in some areas of the country, just because region to region, it's pretty variable. Um, But in some regions, those are very, very tight markets. And so there's not really an alternative feed that you can give to these animals in the feed yard to make that ration a little bit cheaper. Everything is high priced, grain sorghum, wheat, corn, soybeans. And you have reworked your costs of feeding it's going to be very telling on profitability. It has to be, Caitlin. So to identify feedlot margins, we do rely on a set number of assumptions. So we're not trying to figure out what those rations might change to as you would in the real world. We do it more as a proxy. And what we've seen is that over the first quarter of the year, feedlots largely lost money, at least by our calculation. And they did show a little bit of profitability in March, probably going to show a little bit here in the second quarter. But third quarter is really probably where it's the most at risk. It's going to be ahead of new crop, new crop feed. Um, And so you're probably not going to be able to get that price depreciation related to any sort of production. And that's also where we have the lowest uh, cattle prices for the year on, on the Fed side. And so that's what we're looking at this year. You're probably looking on an annual average. We have still basically close to zero for the average for the whole year. But it's going to be pretty volatile for the feedlot sector in 2021. And now we're looking at a corn and soybean balance sheets that both don't show very much relief on the price front. Probably a lot of the corn marketed, corn and soybeans marketed, even in the early part of this next crop year, are going to achieve higher prices. And you might see those tail off quite a bit later than they, so the opposite effect of kind of what we had this year. If you think back to summer of 2020, we actually were still looking at sub $3 corn, which is incredible to even think about compared to where we are now. And so you've really seen a difference in what that marketing year trajectory looks like. And and that'll change again next year, just based on what we see the price and production pattern being. Well, Caitlin, with all this tumultuous activity going on affecting the markets, looking for some good news. And one can find it, you say, in the latest beef export update, the monthly numbers. So we've been talking about domestic demand a lot of times, but the export demand 
for the first two months of the year wasn't very strong. We were down more than 5% in January and February, but March posted the single largest beef export number on record. It was enormous, 300 million pounds from on a carcass weight basis and actually so did pork. So March was an enormous number for the red meat sector. Pork exports were over 728 million pounds. And so from a year over year comparison, beef exports were up about 12%. So double digit growth compared to a year ago. And if you think back, March, 2020 was largely before the pandemic for the U.S., Uh, Not necessarily the case for some of our export destinations, but that's a very strong number. And I think what's unique about this is where we've seen that growth. China, quote, purchased about 84 million more pounds than last year for the whole quarter. Uh, So not necessarily a, a giant gain, but still very impressive. We saw exports increase from Hong Kong, Mexico, South Korea, and Vietnam. And those are all key destinations for the U.S. beef sector. South Korea, Mexico, Vietnam is becoming a bigger player in China. Now more and more is being talked about is in that top five. I think it remains to be seen if they remain that top five after African swine fever subsides. But that is probably a much medium term to longer term perspective than than the short term. And so we're expecting China to continue to be a big buyer. But Mexico, too, is an important player in our market and their economic growth has shown through. They actually bought more of almost all meat and poultry items than they did a year ago in March. And so all positive things on the meat and poultry front and and China too is always an exciting talking point when we're talking about the meat markets. Good to hear. Appreciate your input as always, Caitlin. Thanks for joining us, for passing along all of this. We'll catch up with you again not too long down the road. Thank you. Caitlin McCulloch, the director of the Livestock Marketing Information Center and a frequent contributor to our cattle market segment here on Agriculture Today. Incidentally, it's worth your while, producers, to have a look at the LMIC website for constantly updated and useful market information, lmic.info, lmic.info. This is the K-State Radio Network. Kansas farmers and ranchers are helping feed your family in the world. The largest contributor to the Kansas economy is beef cattle. How do you get that juicy steak on your plate? In order for you to enjoy your tasty meal, it requires the hard work of the producers, marketers, advertisers, processors, inspectors, transporters, packers, and consumers. So thank all these people and sit back, relax, and enjoy your tasty meal. We're back now on Agriculture Today. Well, routinely, the staff at the Beef Cattle Institute here at K-State fields questions on cattle health management from producers. A couple of examples turned up on the BCI's recent Cattle Chat podcasts. Generic antimicrobial treatment products. Do they stack up to the mainstay products? And how can one tell the difference between BVD and Yoni's disease in the cow herd? Taking on those K-State veterinarians Brad White, Bob Larson, and Brian Lubers, with livestock economist Dustin Pindle lending to the conversation as well. Here's Brad. We've had a lot of talk, and I've had a couple questions recently, because we've had generics or products that are produced by other companies that have come out onto the to the cattle market for a while. It's not new. Some of the, some of the products have been around for a while, but recently we see several new antimicrobials come out that would be generics. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what does that mean for my operation? Is that something I should consider? Is it something I should not consider? Are there things I should worry about? What do you think for my ranch? Sure. Yeah, and we we're going to start seeing some more generics coming on the market. And I think I think a lot of people are familiar with generics, right? Just from their own personal use, right? When we, if I go to the physician, um, most of the time, if he's prescribing something for me, I'm likely getting a generic. And the and the advantages to generics are are obvious. It's cost, right? Generic products are cheaper to purchase, and so there's always a concern with that you know, if they're cheaper, are they as good? Is there some reason why they're cheaper? 
And the reason why generic drugs are cheaper is because the, the approval process that a drug will go through. So if a drug manufacturer, a drug sponsor, wants their drug approved, they have to go through a process that's outlined by the FDA. And the process is slightly different for the generic drugs because we already have a lot of the information from what we call the pioneer product. So the brand name product that was originally approved that the generic is now copying. And there are several ways that a generic can get approved without making it too complicated. They essentially have to be equivalent in the drug and the drug formulation that's in the bottle. That's probably the easiest pathway. So you can have generic drugs that are manufactured in the same facility as a pioneer product. And so if they're going through the same manufacturing process, it's the same drug in the bottle. They can generally be approved pretty quickly as a generic. If it's not the same, then the the sponsor of the generic product, they have to show that the effects are equivalent. And one of the common questions that I get is, and it comes out several different ways, but One of the common myths is that a generic drug can have 80% of the drug that's in the Pioneer product. And that 80% number comes from, there is some regulation within the FDA. There's, if you have the Pioneer product, not all animals will absorb and metabolize every drug the same. And so even within animals, there's some variation in how much drug they're actually exposed to. And so with the generic drug sponsor has to do. They know what the variation for the pioneer product, and then there's some allowable variability within the generic. But to make it short, to get a generic drug approved, you really have to be very close to the same levels of drug in the animals that you would see in the pioneer product. And so... So so one of the reasons that generics are cheaper that I'm getting from you is not just because they're more cheaply made it's because they don't have the research dollars invested to initially prove out that it worked is that accurate that is true so with that pioneer product the first product they have to show both that the drug is effective which you mentioned they also have to show that it's safe for the animals that it's going to be used in if you're a drug sponsor going through the generic approval process If your drug is similar enough to that Pioneer product, that branded product, you don't have to go through those two sections. You can say our drug is the same and we're going to use the data that was originally established for the Pioneer to show that the drug works and that the drug is safe. It makes sense then why some of our, why we don't see a bunch of new products every year because they spend a lot of time in development and some of those will fall out of the process, rightfully so along the way because of some issue. But then as we see these generics come out, and and you mentioned, so they should have the same bioequivalence or the same action in the animal as they come on the market. Any thoughts on using those or switching from one to the other? In my opinion, the generics have been shown to be bioequivalent. They should be safe. They should be effective just as the Pioneer product. So I, I don't have any problems recommending those products that have gone through that process, I think. And that's, you know, the approval process is there to protect the people that are using those products. So I think you can move forward with generics with confidence. So don't be surprised as those come on the market. And I think this is a great opportunity to talk to your veterinarian, especially because some of these products will be non-prescription. Some of them will be prescription. So talk to your veterinarian about what makes sense for your operation? Because we can't see exactly what's going on at your place. So there may be some differences where they say, hey, we we think this is the right plan. But that's why you have that veterinary client-patient relationship. I do want to, as, as we always enjoy having a listener question, we had a really good listener question this week about Yoni's. And Yoni's, J-O-H-N-E-S, Yoni's disease is a disease which will cause diarrhea, especially in adult cattle, many times older cows. So we may think of this in older cows that are five to seven years old. The question from the listener, which I think is a good question, is what are some of the similarities and differences between BVD, bovine viral diarrhea, and Yoni's? And Bob, I'm going to turn to you and I give you a first shot at this. Oh, as my first shot is it's really unfortunate 
that diarrhea is in the name of bovine viral diarrhea, because that's actually one of the signs that we don't see very often. This, this disease first was apparent or was first discovered in the late 1940s, early 1950s. And at that time, diarrhea was one of the, the signs that you saw frequently. But, but the disease has changed over time and that it's pretty rare honestly, for an animal to show signs of diarrhea, but we're stuck with it still in the name. So that lays the groundwork. When I think of yonis, I think of adult cows with diarrhea. And so if I saw an adult cow with unexplained diarrhea, yonis would be very high on my list of things that are probably causing that. If I saw an adult cow with diarrhea, bovine viral diarrhea would actually be very, very low on my list. Not as likely. It is possible, but not as likely to be associated with that. Both of these diseases are in some ways similar, but in other ways quite different in that BVD, I see probably my biggest problems in young animals because it's probably the most important thing it does is it suppresses the immune system. So you can see calves with pneumonia, maybe due to BVD, but maybe due to something else, but their immune system was just suppressed by the BVD virus. And so you see that, you see some lamenesses in adult cows and stuff, all kind of other problems that were made more possible because BVD suppressed the immune system. So that's what I think of when I think of BVD. Although the other classic one is some abortions and some pregnancy loss and those types of things. Yoni's disease, almost the only sign I see is diarrhea. And if I see an adult animal with diarrhea, that is really high on my list of things to be concerned about. If I'm worried about BVD, I'm typically thinking about younger animals, you know, less than a year, two years of age, particularly calves, and kind of a a wide variety of things. Reproduction issues, yes, but other health issues as well. And diarrhea is not the highest thing on my list. So unfortunate that the name is what it is, and it makes it kind of confusing. Got a quick question for you then. Prevalence and just maybe, I don't know if it's geographic region, but just yeah. across the U.S., is one versus the other, BVD versus Yonis, is one more prevalent? That's actually a good question, and they're both relatively rare, but important if they occur. So um, for BVD, our best estimate is about 7% of cow herds um, have kind of BVD circulating in those herds at a level that, that's probably concerning, all right? And so, you know, in a county, that would mean that there's several herds that are dealing with BVD, but 93% are not. So it's common enough that as a veterinarian, oh, I see it. You know, I've got several herds that are, are dealing with this, but it's not every herd dealing with it. Yoni's disease, somewhat the same way. Uh, I'm not quite as comfortable saying what the percentage is, but many herds, it's either not a problem or a very small problem historically been a bigger issue among dairies, but then dairies have really done a good job over the last 20 years of addressing this disease and bringing it down to where it's much, much less common on on dairy farms. So in both those situations, a vast majority of herds do not have either one of these diseases, but enough do that as a veterinarian working in in a several county area, all have several herds that are, that are dealing with it. Uh, And so it's, it's, If it's your herd, it's a big deal, but it's certainly not a majority of herds. K-State's Bob Larson, Brian Lubers, Brad White, and Dustin Pindle. The Cattle Chat podcast series can be found at ksubci.org. This is Agriculture Today. When a thunderstorm approaches, follow these safety tips. Lightning, known as the underrated killer, usually strikes the tallest objects. So avoid standing beneath trees or other isolated tall objects. Take shelter in a sturdy building. Remember, if you're close enough to hear thunder, you're close enough to be struck by lightning. Help keep you and your family safe this severe weather season. For the National Weather Service, I'm Bill Curtis. Welcome back to Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you, and next up, today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN, the 
Winter wheat crop mostly escaped disaster from that late April freeze in the central and southern Great Plains, though the reports of isolated damage have surfaced here and there. The executive vice president of the Wheat Quality Council, Dave Green, says that the crop mostly dodged a bullet. However, he said some fields that were heading out in the lower-lying areas of central and southwest Oklahoma sustained heavy losses. Green said there wasn't widespread damage that affected entire counties. He thinks that producers in Kansas feel pretty good about the stands, and there was no damage in Nebraska nor in Colorado, but he did note those isolated issues in Oklahoma. Now, K-State wheat production specialist Romolo Lulato said last week that the flag leaf on some wheat plants in some Kansas fields was coming out yellow, indicating a dead tiller. Low incidents so far, but some tillers, says Romolo, were lost. And the CEO of the Oklahoma Wheat Commission, Mike Schulte estimates 3 to 5 percent of that state's winter wheat crop sustained freeze damage. Yield losses in affected fields will likely range from 2 to 3 percent to isolated instances of 90 to 95 percent or a complete loss, according to Schulte as he spoke with DTN. Now, scouts participating in the Wheat Quality Council's 2021 Hard Red Wheat Tour next week will have an opportunity to further assess the condition of this year's crop. Romolo, of course, will be on that tour, and he'll be providing updates from it each day here on Agriculture Today. After months of hosting educational events virtually because of the pandemic, K-State Research and Extension will host its Spring Crops Field Day in southeast Kansas a week from this Wednesday, May the 19th, at the Southeast Research and Extension Center at Parsons. Registration there starts at 8.30. The tour will roll at 9 o'clock that morning. K-State Research Agronomist at the Center, Gretchen Sassenrath, has the rundown on it. We're going to have a tour of the wheat variety plots, so you can come out and see both the hard wheat and the soft red wheat varieties that we have here at the station. They're looking great this year, so it'll be interesting to see them, and all of the activities are in the field, so you can actually get out and take a look at the varieties and see how they're doing. Mm -hmm. Dr. Alan Fritz, the K-State wheat breeder, will be on board to talk about the different varieties. So he'll open the program, Will Allen, with that tour of 41 varieties at the wheat plots there at Parsons. And then following up, K-State's wheat disease specialist will take on a very topical matter at this time of the year. Yes, Dr. Kelsey anderson Onifree has been doing a research study down here about Fusarium head blight, and in particular control of head blight. Southeast, or actually eastern Kansas, has a real challenge with Fusarium head blight because we usually get rain right around wheat bloom time, and that's a critical time to control the fusarium head blight, head scab. And Kelsey is doing a study down here. Again, we're going to have an in-field tour of the wheat disease plots and see different control mechanisms. We've got uh, 12 different formulations that have been applied, and so farmers can go out and actually look at the wheat and compare disease prevalence with these different formulations. Excellent. So that will be timely indeed with harvest time about a month away or so. Then into cover crops and one of your colleagues from here on campus will be aboard to talk about those as well. Yes, Dr. Anita Dilley, the weed ecologist in the Department of Agronomy, has again a study going on here at the station looking at cover crops to control weeds also looking at soil health and how the cover crops affect soil health. So she's got cover crop plots at the station and then is looking at different weed counts in those cover crop plots. So again, farmers can come and look and see what the cover crops look like, how well they grow, and how well they reduce weeds or control weeds. And then the last formal presentation on the tour, a look at pasture fertility and weed control. Gretchen, talk about that. Yes, we're really excited about that. Dr. Bruno Pedrera has joined our team. He's the regional agronomist for the southeast region. He is going to be focusing his research on pasture and crop production. And he's got a study that we actually started a year ago looking at pasture fertility and, in particular, broom sedge control. So we've got plots on the station, 
and we're going to be introducing Bruno, and he'll give you a little background about himself, and you'll get a chance to meet our new regional agronomist. And then there will be a sponsored lunch on site? Yes. We've got a good support from our sponsors, and we'd like to just use the time to visit with folks. It's not going to be a real fancy lunch. It'll just be a sack lunch. But just give us a chance to actually meet with folks and talk. I know the programming has been a little bit thin this past year, except online. So we're real excited to actually have folks on site and be able to interact with all the producers. So no registration fee. However, Gretchen, you do want a head count for the lunch. So you are asking for pre-registrations. Yes, that would be appreciated. Make sure we have enough sandwiches. And how, how to go about that? Just contact the center directly? Yes. You can either contact myself at uh, 620-820-6131 or the Wildcat District at 620-784-5337. Full information can be found as well at southeast.ksu.edu. K-State Research Agronomist Gretchen Sassenrath there. On the Spring Crops Field Day being hosted by K-State's Southeast Research and Extension Center Wednesday, May the 19th at the center on the north edge of Parsons. And want to remind you as well about something that we first informed you of last week. The Agricultural Economics Department here at K-State will be hosting a series of webinars on Kansas farmland values and farm income via Zoom. And the first session will be this coming Wednesday, May the 12th, from 1230 to 130 that afternoon. There's no fee involved, but registration is required. It's a three-part series to lend more information about land values, property valuation, for tax purposes and 2020 net farm income and projections for 2021. The session this Wednesday on Kansas land values, that'll be presented by K-State's Robin Reed and Alan Featherstone. Property valuation of ag land in Kansas by Alan on May the 19th, then May the 26th, the Farm Management Association 2020 summary of net farm income and projections for 2021. Great series. Take it in starting this Wednesday the 12th at 1230. For more, find out at agmanager.info. This is Agriculture Today. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. Welcome back, and thanks for joining us on Agriculture Today. Along with Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. 4-H Camference, sponsored by the Kansas 4-H Youth Leadership Council, is being held June 27th through the 30th at Rock Springs 4-H Center. The event, which combines the fun of a camp with hands-on learning skills and activities of a conference, targets middle school youth ages 12 to 14. Southeast Area Kansas 4-H Youth Development Specialist Beth Hinshaw says that 4-H Camference is an opportunity for youth to take their 4-H experience to the next level. Beth, probably one of the highlights for some of the tweeners, as we like to call them, as they look at 4-H Camference coming up in June. Yes, we are so excited to be back to Rock Springs 4-H camp this summer, and conference is going to be June 27 through 30. And conference, people may remember, is for those young people who are ages 12 to 14. So it's very focused on that middle school age. And why the focus on the middle schoolers at this point? You know, Camperance was dreamed up by young people who went to National 4-H Conference probably 15 years ago. And what they were seeing was that at middle school is when young people start having lots of other opportunities. And they wanted something that was a 4-H opportunity to really help them understand what great opportunities lie ahead in the 4-H program, kind of a you know, an incentive, stay in 4-H. 
The other thing that they were seeing is that, you know, when people have all those opportunities, sometimes they choose a different path. So that's what their original intent was. And it's also the age when young people can maybe still go to camp, but they're starting to age out of camp, you know, depending on the 4-H camp. And there are other state opportunities like Discovery Days or other things like that, but sometimes kids are not ready to make that big leap to something like that. And so it was seen as a bridging type event as well, kind of going from camp into some of those other educational opportunities. Well, you mentioned the other opportunities that come along at that time, and I'm thinking that leadership opportunities also come along in terms of maybe at school and also within the 4-H club. Definitely. And we know that the leadership opportunity and the leadership experience that kids get in 4-H is going to help them become, you know, leaders in their school, in their community. And that's one of the things that we like to focus on at Camp Prince. You know, we talk about all of the fun of 4-H camp because we're going to ride horses, we're going to paddle canoes, We're going to do the adventure course, which we need to talk about also, but we're also going to have some very specific workshops that help these teenagers with some leadership skills and thinking about how they can use those back in their community. Well, because you brought it up, let's talk about that adventure course. Yes. So some of our young people on the State 4-H Council have worked with the foundation on promoting the new adventure course, which uh, will be a high ropes type course at Rock Springs. And the delegates for Camperance will get several opportunities to be on that adventure course. And I just think it's going to be great. So they'll learn some skills through this adventure course. Is that kind of the idea? Yes. That opportunity is guided by a trained staff member. And They're trying to get at those aspects of teamwork, working together, coming to consensus, all of those good kinds of skills that you can learn at camp and then learn through that adventure program. They also have some icebreaker activities. What type of things are those? You know, we will work in camp groups, and so we have a a morning session, you know, each morning of camp that we call mail call, where we work on getting acquainted with your camp group, also doing a little bit of work on, you know, what'd you learn yesterday? How could you use that the next day? You know, our whole thought is that we want everybody at Camp Prince to know each other by the time it's over. And the leadership activities, are those designed by the Youth Leadership Council? Some of the leadership activities will be a part of the camp activities that we do, but other parts of those are part of the workshops that might be evening activities or that morning mail call time, and those are designed by the youth council members. They'll also hear from a guest speaker. Has the speaker been lined up yet? The guest speaker is typically a former youth council member, usually somebody who's in college. We always like to make that connection with young people that You know, you are learning skills that are going to take you into college and career. And so our guest speakers oftentimes are in college or just out of college and can relate to, you know, what they're going through, their experience at Camp Prince and how that will help them in the future. Always more powerful to hear from someone who's been through it. Most definitely. You know, we love hearing from our 4-H alums in lots of the things that we do in Kansas 4-H and seeing the ways that they have taken what they've learned in Kansas 4-H into the college or career setting. I know that space is limited for this and registration deadline is coming up fairly soon. So what's the process for getting registered? If you go to the State 4-H website, you'll see either a register here button or under what's hot. You can click on that where it talks about conference and read all about it, the dates, the times, what you need to bring, those kinds of things. And registration will go through May the 15th if it's still open. 
we always have a limit on campers and you know as long as we've done it we have always sold out so it's important that if people are interested that they get registered as soon as possible and we'll also take a wait list just in case there's any cancellations a little later in the spring or early summer. And if they're not familiar with everything that goes on at Camference, everything is on the 4-H website, so they can go there and check out all of the information. Yes, and our website is www.kansas4h.org. That's Southeast Area Kansas 4-H Youth Development Specialist Beth Hinshaw with information on this year's 4-H Camference being held June 27th through the 30th at Rock Springs 4-H Center. Again, the registration deadline is this Saturday. For more information, visit kansas4h.org. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. For Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network.